because I think the ACC, you can make a strong argument, it's the best league in college football when it comes to the quarterback position. This year, not every year, this year. Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, August 3rd edition of Always College Football. I'm your host, Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, is Mark Kubiak. We really appreciate you being with us today, whether it's on Apple Podcast, on Spotify, or if you're here with us on the ESPN YouTube channel, please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out. It helps the show out. And we look forward to interacting with you in the comments so that we can tailor the show to where you guys think we need to tailor it to. Of course, we are here for you. We have a terrific game plan in store for you today as we're going to focus on the quarterback position. That's right. It's going to be all about the QBs, which I'm very much at home talking about. I'm all about talking about the quarterbacks. However, it might be a little different than what you're used to when talking about the bigger picture and that position. We're not going to talk about Bryce Young. We're not going to talk about CJ Stroud. And we're not going to talk about Caleb Williams. It's no disrespect to those three, but you can get coverage of those three guys anywhere you want to look. We're here to serve the fan and we're here to serve all of college football. So we're going to focus our attention outside the big three. It's going to be part of a series. We're going to do it at a few different positions, quarterback being the first. We look forward to continuing to discuss quarterbacks because we won't hit them all today. I just want to warn you in advance, if we don't hit your guy, he's probably coming in a future episode. So don't panic. Don't freak out. Just like, rate, and subscribe, and maybe we'll get to your guy here in the days and weeks to come. So without much further ado, we're going to dive right in the most important position in all of football. It's the quarterback. All right, let's talk about it. We know that this position is so important to your success that you almost have to have one in order to chase a championship, to, to, to chase a division title, or to chase wins whatsoever. You have to have good quality quarterback play. The good news is in college football, pretty much across the board, there's actually excellent quarterback play being had, not just at the power five level, but at the group of five level. So we're going to dive into guys that are firmly established starters going into this upcoming season. They might be in competitions. Yeah, that's fine. But we're going to declare them the starter right here on Always College Football. So why not? Let's start with a couple of transfer quarterbacks that are stepping into significant roles. We're going to start with the Oklahoma quarterback situation. When talking about quarterbacks, you always feel like you need to start with Oklahoma. In comes Dylan Gabriel. He was ranked number five last year, according to some publications, number five quarterback in college football coming into last year. Well, it was an injury riddled season, had his throwing shoulder a little bit banged up, and he missed most of the year. So it just really wasn't the year that many expected from Dylan Gabriel. That's why he's kind of slipped in a lot of people's minds. But I'm telling you, do not discount what this guy can do when he's fully healthy. If you look at the performance that he's had over the course of his career, two years and change as a starting quarterback for UCF in a pass-happy offense that's going to empower the quarterback, which, by the way, has been at times led by Jeff Lebby, who is now leading the Oklahoma offense. The guy accounted for over 8,000 passing yards, 70 touchdowns against just 14 interceptions. I'd say that's productive. Great instincts, great feel for the deep ball, and I think does a really solid job of extending plays, which you might have to do at the quarterback spot. I think Oklahoma is in great shape at quarterback. I love that Gabriel ended up there, and I can't wait to see him play against top-tier competition like he hasn't had the chance to do at UCF over the last few years. We'll next go to another quarterback that Oklahoma fans will be quite familiar with. That's Spencer Rattler. He is now at South Carolina, heading to try to find his way again. Look, we've seen it in the past. We've seen quarterbacks enter the season as the face of college football. Sam Darnold comes to mind. Other quarterbacks come to mind. Jameis Winston comes to mind back in 2014. When you're the face of college football, every single thing you do is going to be overly scrutinized. Fair or unfair, that's what you sign up for. So when you look at what Spencer Rattler was at the end of 2020, the guy as a freshman was unbelievable. He's got still, when you think about it, he has a career completion percentage of over 70%, and his touchdown interception ratio over the course of his career is 40 to 12. The problem is last year, it felt like he was playing with everything to lose. 
He wasn't the gunslinger that we saw at the end of his freshman campaign, redshirt freshman campaign. He wasn't the guy that was leading the Big 12 champions down the field against a good quality Iowa State defense to secure the victory. He looked like he was gun shy. And when you start at the top, there's only one direction to go. And it felt like he was playing to just not make a mistake. Everyone said he was the Heisman favorite. Everyone said he was the first overall pick. That's pretty heavy burden to deal with when you're just a 20 to 21 year old guy. He's now at South Carolina, a fresh start playing for a coach in Shane Beamer that's going to empower him, that's going to make him feel confident, that's going to turn him into that gunslinger yet again. I'm very optimistic about what we're going to get from Spencer Rattler. And if we get anything like what we got in 2020, South Carolina's a dangerous team in the SEC East. All right, moving to some guys that had some great years last year. I'm going to start with maybe one of my favorite and most underappreciated quarterbacks in all of college football. It's Cam Rising for the Utah Utes. When he settled in in the back half of the season, Utah looked like a completely different team. What you like most about what we've seen from Cam Rising is that when he's away from home, he's at his best. In biggest games, he's at his best. We saw him in the Rose Bowl. Everyone saw him torch Ohio State. We saw him against SC. And I know SC wasn't great, but it's still SC. When he's gone on the road, he was 4-1 and one with 10 touchdowns against zero interceptions. I'd say that's pretty dang impressive. And the, what he did in the Rose Bowl left everybody in college football feeling great about what he could ultimately accomplish. The guy I've kind of compared him to, and this is, to me, a glowing comparison because I love this dude. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm a Cowboy fan. This was the quarterback of my childhood, all right? Or I guess my impressionable years. Tony Romo is who Cam Rising reminds me of. It's not always pretty. It isn't always by the book, but he finds a way. He's got sneaky mobility. He's very accurate. He's tough as nails, and he shows up in big games, which is exactly what I want to see from Cam Rising as he enters into the season as the unquestioned starter and a guy who's basically going to shoulder the load of the Utah Utes playoff hopes. They can make a run and they get off to a difficult start on the road at Florida, but Cam Rising, I want him on the road. I want him in a big game. I want him with a big spotlight because that's when I feel like I'm going to get his best. That's why he would certainly make one of the top lists for me as one of the best quarterbacks in America. Let's go next to a guy that some say he's a product of the system. Is he? It's impossible to tell. He's Will Rogers of Mississippi State. Statistically speaking, what more do you want from him? Last year, completed almost 74% of his passes. Probably going to throw for over 4,500 yards. Probably going to throw for over 40 touchdowns. He's going to get ample opportunities in Mike Leach's system. But when you watch what Will, Will Rogers does, he throws guys open. He has pinpoint accuracy. And it's not just a bunch of dink and dunk four, five, six yards at the line of scrimmage, behind the line of scrimmage, he's pushing the ball downfield. He can layer the football. He's got sneaky mobility, has a little bit of a cowboy type of approach with how he kind of can create and how he can keep plays alive. He's tough as nails. And if you look back at just some of his difficult performances last year, you can almost always chalk it up to the fact that he was just in over his head because his supporting cast wasn't up to stuff. Alabama comes to mind. I think Will Anderson and Will Rogers might be best friends because he lived in the backfield the entire game. The tackle spot, especially the right side for Mississippi State, struggled last year, and they just couldn't get in much of a rhythm against a couple different teams. Now, they did pad the stats a little bit. LSU game comes to mind. The performance, the turnaround that you got against Auburn comes to mind. Um, there were a lot of things to like about what Will Will Rogers. Why do I have such a hard time saying that? Will Rogers did last year. Uh, really love his accuracy. Really love how in that system you tend to get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better every single year. Well, you got a little bit better from year one to year two. Now, what will it look like from year two to year three? Some people think Mississippi State's a dark horse. Wouldn't shock me. Last year with kind of how they performed, they did great against subpar competition at times. They also did poorly against great competition at times. I want to see consistency. And Will Rogers, I think, can deliver that. And if you look, too, at his adjusted completion percentage, I referenced the fact that he completed nearly 74% of his passes. But when you take out the drops, you take out balls batted at the line of scrimmage, that adjusted completion percentage was just above 81%. 
That's the third highest in the SEC since 2014. The other two that were above that, Mac Jones in 29, uh, 2020, he was just over 84%. And Joe Burrow, who was just under 82% in 2019. Obviously, those two guys, both Heisman finalists, those two guys ran a little bit different offensive style. But either way, adjusted completion percentage over 81%. You're doing what you got to do, Will Rogers. And I think you have a chance to take the next step here in 2022. Let's go next to another quarterback in the SEC West. It's KJ Jefferson for the Arkansas Razorbacks. This young man impressed me an awful lot last year. You knew what he was as an athlete. You knew what he was as a runner. But to see how he developed over the course of the season as a passer and to get more confident as the season went along as a passer was something I was really proud of. Now, he does a great job of running this offense led by Kendall Bryles. They're going to run him some. They're going to throw it on some of the underneath stuff. But with this offense, with safeties who are probably going to be creeping up towards the line of scrimmage, you got to be able to keep them honest by throwing it over their head. Good news, KJ Jefferson showcased the ability to do that at times last year. Look, it's no secret what Arkansas wants to be. They want to be a physical, downhill, rushing attack. We get that. But in the SEC, sometimes the path of least resistance is through the air, which is why Jefferson bursts onto the scene last year, I think from a national standpoint, against Alabama. When you throw for 326 yards on the road and give your team a chance, that tells you all you need to know. That's a great performance. And of course, with his unbelievable receiver, Traylon Burks, that was one that probably boosted Traylon's uh, draft stock up into the first round, naturally, where he's now going to be a Tennessee Titan. So excited to see him at the next level. But KJ Jefferson now, there are a few more unknowns on the perimeter than there were last year. That's fine. He's just going to have to get just the tiniest bit more accurate, I think, on some of the underneath stuff. He's got to be just the tiniest bit more accurate and being able to anticipate throws. But all that comes with reps. All that comes with experience. And I happen to think he's poised to make a significant run where his rushing attributes speak for themselves. They always have. But now what he's going to be able to add to the passing game and getting a little more comfortable in that passing posture, there's a lot of reason for optimism from the Hogs quarterback this year. Let's go to the ACC now for the final four that we're going to talk about today. Because I think the ACC, you can make a strong argument, it's the best league in college football when it comes to the quarterback position. This year, not every year, this year. Let's start at Virginia, strong lefty and Brennan Armstrong. If you look at what he did as far as productivity last year, is ridiculous. The guy averaged over 420 yards per game in total offense. That's probably the best. I don't know if it's the best, but it's probably among the best in college football. Massive numbers, massive numbers. And now he's got a new head coach in Tony Elliott, who has always, if you remember right, who has always, with Trevor Lawrence and with Deshaun Watson, always featured the quarterback position and put a lot on the quarterback's shoulders. Now, will Brennan Armstrong be able to match what he did last year in nearly 4,500 yards, 31 touchdowns against just 10 interceptions? I want to see the interception number go down just a little bit, but I also think the yardage and the output in the red zone can potentially go up. He's got a solid supporting cast, and he's a pretty good athlete as well. So expect the lefty to have a big year. Just please, Virginia, play a little defense for him so the guy's not getting the massive shootouts. Let's go next to Tyler Van Dyke at Miami. What a surprise. Last year, we're talking about De'Eric King at this point of the season. Say, hey, he's a sneaky Heisman front runner. Keep an eye on De'Eric King. Well, it doesn't go to plan. King gets a little banged up, gets banged up against Michigan State, has a couple ups and downs. The guy was tough as nails, by the way. Loved De'Eric King. It just wasn't meant to be last year. Well, in comes Tyler Van Dyke. Nobody knew anything about this guy, and he ends up finishing with nearly 3,000 yards, 25 touchdowns against just six interceptions. Very, very impressive to see how he played down the stretch. He started the final nine games, and they finished six and three. And honestly, big reason why they finished six and three is because of him. I mean, he had three or more touchdown passes in each of the last six games for the Hurricanes. So you saw the lights start to come on. And if you look at the wins against both Pitt and NC State, you got to think that Mario Cristobal probably was attracted to the job for a lot of different reasons. But the reason why we think that they can win right now is because of Tyler Van Dyke. He's accurate. He actually has sneaky mobilities, really solid athlete. You wouldn't think that when you first take a glance at him, but you watch some of the plays, some of the plays that he extends, some of the creative plays that he make, uses with his legs. Uh, he's got sneaky mobility, and he's a big reason 
why a lot of people are looking at Miami out of the Coastal and the ACC as a dark horse, not just to win that division, but to win the league overall. Let's go to Devin Leary now at NC State. Speaks for itself. 35 touchdowns against five interceptions, seven to one ratio, rock solid. And it's really the first time he's had the chance to be the full-time guy from start to finish. He's had some injuries. He's been a little bit banged up. There have been bright spots in the past, but to see it now over the course of an entire regular season was really gratifying. Through multiple touchdowns in almost every game, only one in which he didn't throw multiple touchdowns, and he finished with a ridiculous stretch in the last five games, 18 touchdowns against just three interceptions in the last five games. So if you look at what Bryce Young did and what C.J. Stroud did, you know who's the only other returning FBS quarterback in which they had an 18-3 to touchdown interception ratio stretch? That'd be Devin Leary. So that's pretty dang impressive when you look at what they've been able to do. A lot of people started to take notice of Devin Leary, and now with an entire season under his belt, the reason why people are high on NC State this year is because of Devin Leary, because of that front seven defensively, and because of what they bring back. But ultimately... In that league, the ACC specifically, could all come down to quarterback play. And that's why I think NC State is extremely well positioned. Then finally, maybe the young sung hero in college football last year is Sam Harden. Doesn't check the measurable boxes. Doesn't always step off the bus as the leader of the Demon Deacons. And you think, man, that dude right there, he's a war daddy. He's not the biggest, not the tallest, not the fastest, not the strongest arm. But my goodness, does he make good decisions. It's maybe a great understanding of what Wake Forest needs to be offensively. You know that slow mesh where you kind of have to let things develop. You got to be really patient. Well, Sam Hartman's instincts and his patience and his ability to get the ball out really quickly. He's got fast hands and get the ball out really quickly after making a decision is why he would certainly make the list this year. He's not going to sneak up on anybody. The guy threw for nearly 4,300 yards last year and 30, 39 touchdowns. Did have the 14 interceptions. Needs to clean some of that up. But this was an offense last year that was fourth in the FBS in averaging 41 points per game. They bring back a lot of quality pieces. Now, can he do it against top quality competition? Because if you look at how the Demon Deeks performed against the likes of Clemson, it was disappointing. Against the likes of Pitt, it was disappointing. I want to see him do it and Wake Forest do it against the best quality competition. And if he does, they'll be in a really good spot if they head into this year. Problem is, part of the reason why they struggled in those big games is because Hartman threw for, said 14, inter 14 interceptions. Well, half of those came against the two ranked teams that they faced. So he's got to improve here now in year number five as not the starting quarterback, but he's a fifth year player. He's got to play like it. He has to make great decisions from start to finish. Becker, you just ripped through a bunch of great quarterbacks. My question is out of those guys, feet to the fire, which one is going to help their team win a few more games this year? Ooh, a few more games this year. Well, yeah, I like, think to I mean, go is anybody on that cusp of a playoff or a New Year's Six game that weren't there? Well, I, I think Cam Rising to me now with a full season under his belt has. I mean, the reason why I feel like Utah can make the playoffs is because of Cam Rising. I mean, I'm not obviously they have other pieces. There, he's not alone. But Cam Rising, if he can. If he can multiply the performances like he had against Ohio State last year, this team is crazy dangerous. Crazy dangerous. So I'm very optimistic about what we might get from him. But is he going to mean the difference in like a significant win increase? Probably not. Um, partly because they won a bunch of games last year. So if there's one guy that I'm going to point to that I think could have a massive impact on win-loss record, it's Spencer Rattler. And hey, nobody is going to overlook South Carolina this year. This team went six and six in the regular season. They won their bowl game and they did so oftentimes without any threat of a passing game. Obviously, they played great defense. They did a lot of really nice things on that side of the ball. They won some close games. They also lost a couple close ones as well. But when you look at what Spencer Rattler could be, nobody on this list, whether it's Dylan Gabriel replacing Caleb Williams at Oklahoma, Cam Rising coming back, Will Rogers coming back, KJ Jefferson coming back, Brennan Armstrong coming back, Tyler Van Dyke coming back, Devin Leary, Sam Hartman. I think all those guys, you kind of are expecting them to improve slightly, maybe even drastically in some cases. 
But the difference between the starting quarterback at South Carolina last year, all three of them, of however many they played, versus the difference between the starting quarterback at South Carolina this year, that is a significant difference on upside. Now, if Spencer Rattler looks like he did in the four games he started last year for Oklahoma, then it could be a little bit like this, which is not going to be ideal. But I happen to think we're going to get the 2020 version of Spencer Rattler when he takes the field for the Gamecocks this year. And I wouldn't be surprised if he meant two or three more wins for the Gamecocks to improve that 6-6 six and six regular season record to potentially a 9-3. and three. You look at the SEC East, there are a lot of winnable games in that division. We don't know what Florida is going to be. We don't know what Kentucky is going to be. I think they'll both be solid, but are they susceptible to potentially lose to the Gamecocks? Sure. I don't think they'll beat Georgia, but it's early. Georgia's breaking in some new pieces defensively. Maybe Spencer Rattler pulls off a miracle, gets it done at home early in the season. They got to go to Arkansas. That'll be a tricky one. So when you look at what Spencer Rattler could mean for the Gamecocks, it wouldn't shock me if they won eight at all. And that's a two-win improvement off of what was a, a season that was an overachiever to begin with. And I'm, you notice, I am I say eight, that's a two-win improvement to me because I only view it in the regular season. Uh, the bowl games, who shows up for bowl games is difficult to, for me to kind of to wrap my head around. So in the regular season, I, I would not at all be surprised if South Carolina ended eight and four. All right, time to turn our attention to the interactions that we get with you. And of course, if you always want to chime in on the mailbag, please do it at always college football at gmail.com. We'll do the best we can to get to your question. We have a long list already of people that have sent some in. So we look forward to interacting with you. So we chose a couple quarterback specific ones today, Kubiak. So let's dial right in. That's right. We're going to start off with Michelle in Fort Mill. There was high expectations for DJ last year, but I think it's safe to say he didn't live up to them. How short of a leash does he have Well, I'll say with this, uh, I think DJ was a little bit the product of unfair expectations. Um, Not that dissimilar to Spencer Rattler. I mean, the weight of the world was on his shoulders last year. And the NIL, I think, became problematic. I think the amount, uh, the the shoes that he had to fill with Trevor Lawrence is difficult naturally. And he just didn't ever look comfortable. Couple that with the fact that he had banged up, man. He had knee injury. When we called a game of his, he had a big old splint on his throwing finger. You know how hard it is to throw when this finger is messed up as a right-handed quarterback? Let me just – I'll just cut to the chase. It's really difficult. So I think that last year, because of the fact that he was just not ever at 100%, made it difficult for him to put his best foot forward. But look at him this year. Down 30 pounds. That's huge. That'll improve his mobility. And he's got to be better. Uh, I think he ranked 15th last year among ACC quarterbacks, 15, that's right, in ACC quarterbacks as far as quarterback efficiency, passing efficiency. Way too many errant passes, way too many things that were off the mark, way too late on a couple throws. And I honestly think that his injuries had a lot to do with it. I don't like excuses, but I ultimately believe he will bounce back. And Klubnik will be good in time. But at this point, came to campus with 180 pounds. Now he's up to 195, they say. Probably lose some of that in fall camp. But is he ready to be the guy just yet? It's difficult for me to anticipate him taking over the starting role, at least in the near term. We'll see what he is down the road. But at this point, I still believe this is DJ Uyungle's team. And he's likely to be the guy, especially knowing he finished with six straight wins. Like this team's going to lean a little bit more on the run. So they're going to take a little pressure off DJ. And that should help with his confidence level. And that should help, I think, with the well-roundedness of what this offense might be. All right. Moving on. Ernie in Texas. There's a lot of pressure to win in College Station right now. Do the Aggies have a QB on the roster that can do that and maybe win in Tuscaloosa this year? If so, who is that? It's funny to me, like every question we get with the Aggies, it's like all about October 8th, like Tuscaloosa. <laughs> so, like, a few games before that. So let's just talk about the picture. Uh, let's talk about the quarterback picture. Is it getting clearer? Um, no, <laughs> if I'm going to be honest, this is probably one of the more difficult quarterback competitions to project. You have Max Johnson, who's the most experienced quarterback of the three that are currently competing. He started all 12 regular seasons games for LSU last year, and he completed over 60% of his passes for almost 2,800 yards and 27 touchdowns. So it's not like this guy hasn't played well in the SEC. He's seen the gauntlet, he's run the gauntlet, and he's actually done some good things 
for LSU. The problem is he has also had some down performances. I don't know how great he is at seeing the rush. I don't know how great he is at anticipating pressure, but all that comes with time. It also, he's a year younger in the system than, or two years younger in the system than Haynes King, who he's also competing with. Haynes King, he was the starter going into the season last year. Had a solid performance with the exception of the interceptions against Kent State. He went for almost 300 yards there in the first game of the season, but the interceptions were something that definitely were ugly. He also went you know, one for two in the second game against Colorado before he was lost early with the broken leg. I think Haynes King, with his mobility, he's got track star speed. Uh, he makes it to... He makes it very interesting, I think, with what he can do with his legs. Now, Max Johnson, look at the spring game. I didn't know he had that kind of wheels. He ran really well there in the spring game, but that's with a different color jersey. and You're not going to get clocked in the spring game. So will you run that well when there's actual live contact coming? Probably a little bit of a difficult thing to anticipate. But Haynes King won the job last year against Zach Calzada, was lost early. So it's kind of a lost season for him. It's difficult to project exactly where he's going to be, but you listen to Jimbo, he's very, very proud of the, of the steps that he's taken to get healthy and the steps he's taken to become a more well-rounded player. And then finally, Connor Wigman, who not a lot of people know about outside of the recruiting guru, gurus that followed this guy. I know he's a natural passer. I know he's a top 50 player, top 20 player, top 30 player in the country, according to whatever publication you want to use. So I know he's got some natural gifts. But this is an offense that is extremely complex, relatively speaking. A lot of offenses, hey, plug and play. You can take a freshman guy, throw him in there. We'll figure it out. This is not one of those offenses. So if for whatever reason he is on the field, it's because this dude is way, way, way mature beyond his years when it comes to understanding and grasp. There's a lot that Jimbo puts on the quarterback position from a checks, from an audible standpoint, from a protection standpoint. And if Connor Wigman can handle all that, then he might be the most talented of the three as far as just a pure passer. If I had to bet, I'd bet on Haynes King right now because I know he's won the job before, but I would not rule out Max Johnson because of his ex- his experience and, and the talent that he showed at times over the last year and change because he started the last two games of 2020. All right, moving on. Jerry from Hilton Head. You seem confident that Tyler Buckner will be the starter at Notre Dame when they open at Ohio State. But is there a chance it's Drew Pine? And if so, what does it say about Buckner? I, I think it's going to be Buckner. Um, just listening to how Brian Kelly raved about Buckner last year, we did their first game against Florida State. And at that point, it was like Jack Cohn's team. We knew it was going to be him. But he couldn't stop saying really nice things about Buckner's mobility and how he might have a package. Don't be surprised if you see 12 out there, all this other stuff. So clearly they valued his skill set last year. And then you look at how they kind of mixed him in against Toledo there in week two. I mean, shoot, his first career snap was like a 30-yard run. So he's got really unique mobility. But also, I think from a passing standpoint, he showcased more to me throwing the football than I anticipated from him. Now, there are a few things that I'd like to see him do a little bit better. The interceptions against Virginia Tech were a little bit troubling. Some of this, he's a little sporadic against Virginia Tech too. I believe that game is like six of 14, missed a couple throws, but that's to be expected. The guy's a freshman, hasn't played in an environment like that and did give them a chance, did just kind of provide a boost to the offense. Now being a situational player versus being an every down player, Two very different things. He's got to be really smart. I don't want to see you running over defenders anymore. Like, stop with that. All right, you got to take care of your body. And I want to just make sure that he's in rhythm from the pocket and he can win from the pocket. We know he's athletic. We know he can create with his own legs. But ultimately, at quarterback, the goal is to distribute the football. He's got really, really nice pieces around him. Solid experience and solid explosiveness at running back. Obviously, amazing tight end group good pieces at wide receiver, distribute the football, let those guys work for you and don't try to do it all yourself. So I think it'll be Tyler Buckner and I expect him to have a really nice season. And we're going to find out week one because he goes on the road into a hostile environment against a defense that at times in the last couple of years has been very susceptible through the year in Ohio State. So I think that we're going to find out all we need to know week one. And I'd be surprised if it's anyone other than Buckner running out there to take the first snap for the Irish. 
Hey, thanks for being with us. We have so enjoyed talking about the quarterback spots at so many different places. We'll do it again. There's still a ton of quarterback situations that we need to evaluate, whether it be unquestioned starters, whether it be competitions, Look, it's the most popular position for a reason. And I promise you here at Always College Football, we will have you prepared for the season. There will be no unknowns about your position of need, the quarterback, of course. So for all of us here at Always College Football, we really appreciate you being with us. Please like, rate, and subscribe. You can interact with the show via email at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. And you can interact with the show via social media at alwayscfb on Twitter and Instagram. So we look forward to our conversations with you there. Hit us up in the comments on the ESPN YouTube channel. It's really beneficial. Tell us how we can get better because we want to cater the show to your needs. So we appreciate everything that we've done together up to this point. We look forward to continuing on on this journey as we head into the college football season. For all of us here at Always College Football, I'm Greg McElroy. He's Mark Kubiak. We hope you have a wonderful day and we look forward to visiting again next time. Remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.